Carly helped us uh, with a lot of the infrastructure of Lobby 3, which is very, uh, there's exciting stuff. We're doing a um, kind of blockchain 101 tutorial for congressional staffers and the representatives themselves and, and lobbyists so they can actually learn what it is. Like we're getting, like our treasury's built up, we're gonna have some funds and voting. Um, go ahead. What I was gonna say on that, right, like regardless of how you feel about, call it blockchain or crypto or NFTs, and I know there's a lot of negative impressions around that. Yeah, and this is not a crypto podcast, so those of you who have, don't change the channel yet, we're getting there. Yeah, 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 no, no, for sure. But, but what I was gonna say about that is like, regardless of those impressions, I think, this technology is going to be with us uh, in sort of fundamental ways. Even when the when the weird overpriced JPEGs die off and, and right. the hype is gone, this tech will be here. And I think we we know the the problem with having a very technologically illiterate Congress. And I think we've seen that play out in social media and in a variety of other ways. So I, I think we can all agree, like just the importance of making sure that our representatives are just better versed in technology. Right. And hopefully one of the things Lobby 3 can do is just help us to leapfrog some of the stages where we just like a completely kind of illiterate body of representatives right. or they, <laughs> that we saw with it, like, you know, social media. Or they media learn it way. from, you know, with a political spin. They learn it um, from the media or donors or, or others, right? Or this becomes a political football and becomes polarizing more than it is. So that's, that's the goal and it's exciting. Yeah. This week on Forward, the one and only Crypto Carly Riley is back. If you remember, she would be on here all the time this past summer. She's back now. We break apart the crypto bro narrative. Is there truth to that? What's true and what's not? We also talk about the boys and men crisis from a female perspective and what's going on in Ukraine with Russia. Breaking that down a little bit. Don't miss it. Tune into Forward right now. Welcome back to the Forward Podcast with Andrew Yang. I'm your host, Andrew Yang, joined by my colleague, Zach Grauman. Go Bills. I love Josh Allen. Nailed it. Living the dream. Uh, but seriously, welcome back. As you can tell, Andrew's not here. Andrew's on vacation. He doesn't take a vacation very often. The only time he really takes a vacay is when Evelyn makes him do something <laughs> with the kids. So he's doing something with the kids, which is uh, running around Disney World today. Oh. Um, oh, yeah. I'm very, very keen on getting some... Like Yang in uh, Alistair hats, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, yeah. I know. I guess, For especially sure. The kids would be cute, but him would just be kind of hilarious. But we're joined by Carly Riley, who many of you have become familiar with during a period where Andrew was running for mayor. We ran this show together. Yeah. Carly has since left us, but True. welcome back to the Thanks. show. Thanks, yeah. yeah. Appreciate it. It feels uh, like a coming home, a homecoming. So today's show should be pretty fun, uh, even though we are Andrew Yang less, but we've got brought the great Carly Riley back. And we are coming at you live from South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. Big shout out out the gate to Emergent Order, who is the production company that is hosting us in their very cool studio. Very, it's frankly cooler than ours and bigger and better air conditioned and all the good things. Um, and also a shout out to the podcast Dad Saves America who is kind of the flagship show out of the studio and very cool. Trying to get Andrew on there too, but that's always a moving target given his schedule. Anyway, Carly, welcome back. Thank you. Glad you're here. Appreciate being here. So I want to talk about the elephant in the room, very important thing. You've left us for your own show um, that seems to be doing well. I'm not going to say doing better than us, but you know, we can tell it, it, it later. In, in within my own niche world, I don't know how to say it. I yeah, I mean, you're a cryptocurrency celebrity. So tell us about no. why you left, not why you left us, but yeah, a little bit why you left us, but what you're up to. What's going on? Sure. Well, you know, love Yang Speaks. was very grateful to uh, get my podcasting start, cut my podcasting teeth, so to speak, mm. on the Yang Speaks channel. Really, just out of necessity, Yang, as you mentioned earlier, Yang was running for mayor. So you were like, hey, come come help co-host this with me. We, we kind of need a second person. And got bit by the podcasting bug, I guess. Mm. Actually, you know, it, it's a, it's a, Yang Speaks played a role in my, where I am today in that. You and I interviewed Ryan Sean Adams. Yeah. Back in the very beginning of last year. Very smart guy, very good very guy. Very smart. Ryan is the co-founder of Bankless, which is a crypto media network. He co-founded it with David Hoffman. And we interviewed him. 
that I, I'd sort of been going down the rabbit hole a little bit prior, but like the crypto rabbit hole, the crypto rabbit hole. But, yeah. but Ryan definitely kicked it off that much further. Went like deep down, and of course, as as people in the space describe, like you just get sucked into this world of Web three and can't look away. And so that started happening. And then Ryan approached me, and he was like, "Hey, um, would you want to come do your own podcast through Bankless?" Mm -hmm. And that is what I have been doing now for the last several months. In addition to, I work a, a job with Block Block, who's an awesome startup. So your, your, what's your show called? Oh, my show is called. You take credit for it, but you get no credit for it. Drum roll, please. Overpriced JPEGs. Which is what NFTs are. Just so, kidding. There's okay, more to them. overpriced JPEGs. Yeah, I mean it, it's somewhat self-explanatory. Overpriced JPEGs being there are a lot of NFTs in the world today that are. Uh, quite literally just like overpriced JPEGs. Yes. And then it's also a tongue-in-cheek reference to the fact that like outsiders to the space think that all NFTs are are overpriced JPEGs, when in reality there's a lot of really interesting deep tech happening that is uh, justifies, call it, the cost. Okay, so let me uh, say a couple of things. Did I say I work on Web3? Have I like properly introed myself to this at all? I like feel like I don't know the Yang oh, Speaks audience anymore. I feel like they know. In, we're clear that you're in Web3, okay. and this is actually my point. <laughs> so I, I, I made a kind of a, a mental list of um, how you can tell someone He's working in crypto. They'll tell you. And um, so number one, right? But let's, number one, they tell you they work in crypto. <laughs> it's like talking to a vegan um, or someone who does CrossFit. Um, it's probably the same. I'm so offended. Um, do you agree with that? Yeah, except I actually, yes, but I really don't like saying I work in it. Like, you know. You, tell, you say you're in media? Uber driver. I say I work at a startup or a tech Ooh, startup. Okay. Like, you know, I because we are at a place where now everybody like has a perception of what that is and has an opinion and sometimes That's it's negative true. or positive and then or they ask you to explain it and I'm like, oh, man, yeah. I'm just trying to get from point A to point B and listen to my listen to a podcast. Okay. So it, it, it's sort of like working on the, the presidential campaign. Oh yeah, we used like to, when you say you work in politics, you work for a candidate, you work for Andrew Yang, it like opens up a whole can of worms. I keep ending up in these industries that are like can of worm industries. Mm -hmm. Where it's not just like I work on insurance and nobody wants to oh, bother you anymore. It. Yeah. So yeah. I I'm now, I went from one industry where I had to pretend I did something else to another industry where I sort of pretend I do something else. That's true. Else. If I ever had time to go to a cocktail party or social gathering on the presidential campaign, people asked what I would do, and I would say, I'm a consultant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or I work, in, I work in policy. That was the other one. Yeah, because people like, don't ask What type of policy? Questions. Oh, boring, behind the scenes, to reform stuff. Yeah. You just, you're just not worth talking. What do you do? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay, so number one. Uh, they tell you. They tell you. Unless they're Number me. two, they use the phrase, in the space. I think this is unique to me. No, it's not. Okay. It's totally not. Um, I've now been to been dragged to enough Web3 events that they use the, the phrase in the space a lot. And it'd be phrases like, oh, he's really well known in the space. Like everybody in the space thinks it's a big deal. Or, well, if you're in the space, blah, 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 blah. But so why mm. is that weird? And I don't know. There's lots of spaces. And I don't think people use that phrase. Well, so he here's what I will say. This feels like a it feels like an out crowd in crowd well, phrase. Uh, here's what I think it is, right? Mm. You have, you do have your own sort of like ecosystem of Web three. Yeah. It, it's my entire Twitter feed is Web three, right? Like it's a, mm -hmm. it's a very all encompassing kind of an ecosystem. Yep. And so we have our own celebrities within Web three. We have our own influencers within Web three. We have our right. own builders, and you start to get to know all these characters and it is hard to kind of, you either say in Web3 or in this space because especially you and I have been working on a, a Web3 project together, like it's important to be able to say, hey, you should you should talk to this person because they matter in the space. Like, and I, that's not true of other, like, I don't know, the world of cosmetics. Startups is very, very yeah. But yeah, like right. it doesn't feel like you have that same sort of insularity and like we're this cultish thing happening. Um, okay. So I don't know, it just is a helpful, it's helpful in okay. conversation to That's my, And then the third one is you have a profile picture of... Yeah, yeah. Like, Bored Ape's too obvious, but but it's usually something that I don't recognize. It's like a non-human. It's a little doodle <laughs> of some sort. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's your PFP profile picture? No, it's just picture? me. It's just you. So I, you don't work in this space. No. <laughs> you, I see what you doing there. Yeah, you don't no, care no, all I, three No, no, this has actually been a very <laughs> intentional thing on my part, which is that I think part of the role I, I hope I can sort of fill is to a little bit have a foot in... In both worlds, I think I love Web3. I think I can speak Web3 and blockchain, and it's my profession now, and I absolutely love it. But I also think I can I can still kind of relate it to or or you know the the normies. Yeah, and I oh, that's think, what you call us. Yeah, <laughs> there it is. Maybe I that's my fourth right there. That... You refer to others not in the space as normie. <laughs> and I th oh, I'm part normie, and I think 
that, uh, yeah, I think it's helpful to have representatives from, from the space. <laughs> Uh, who, who don't necessarily one, huh? like have the 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 weird PFP, right? That that maybe feel more approachable to somebody. So I've I've really intentionally kept my identity my identity, and it's just my own right. headshot. Like, like crypto Carly. So yeah. of so Carly did. I mean, look, the show's going well. It's interesting, especially if you're in the space. It's 2022 and you like to personalize just about everything in your life and yet you drink the same cup of coffee every morning even though it's gotten a little bit stale, you don't know where it's sourced. Why buy the same old, same old? Instead, get a coffee that you know you're going to love because it's made for you. Take the coffee quiz to get started. Trade Coffee will source from America's best independent roasters ethically. So it'll taste great and you'll feel great about it. They guarantee you'll love your first bag or they will replace it for free. Trade has been featured by the New York Times, Wired, GQ, and has delivered over 5 million bags of coffee. Why not to you? For our listeners right now, Trade Coffee is offering a total of $20 off your first three bags when you go to drinktrade.com yang. To get started, take their quiz at drinktrade.com slash yang and start your journey to your perfect cup. That's drinktrade.com slash yang for $20 off your first three bags. Carly helped us uh, with a lot of the infrastructure of Lobby 3, which is very, uh, there's exciting stuff. We're doing a... Um, kind of blockchain 101 tutorial for congressional staffers and the representatives themselves and, and lobbyists so they can actually learn what it is. Like we're getting, like our treasury's built up, we're going to have some funds and voting. Um, go ahead. What I was going to say on that, right, like regardless of how you feel about call it blockchain or crypto or NFTs, and I know there's a lot of negative impressions around that. Yeah, and this is not a crypto podcast, so those of you who have... Don't change the channel yet. We're getting there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, for sure. But, but what I was going to say about that is like regardless of those impressions, I think... This technology is going to be with us uh, in sort of fundamental ways. Even when the when the weird overpriced JPEGs die off and, and right. the hype is gone, this tech will be here. And I think we we know the the problem with having a very technologically illiterate Congress. And I think we've seen that play out in social media and in a variety of other ways. So I, I think we can all agree, like just the importance of making sure that our representatives are just better versed in technology. Right. And hopefully, one of the things Lobby Three can do is just help us to leapfrog some of the stages where we just like a completely kind of illiterate body of representatives right. or they, <laughs> that we saw it, with like, you know, social media. Or they media learn it way. from, you know, with a political spin. They learn it um, from the media or donors or, or others, right? Or this becomes a political football and becomes polarizing more than it is. So that's, that's the goal and it's exciting. Yeah. Um, so tell us, you know, one of the things I, um, you've been doing a lot to kind of broaden the lens of, I think web, the Web3 space specifically outside the U.S. and you've been mm. traveling. So tell us like what your, your kind of vision for this is and um, especially for folks on this pod who, who probably are not, I mean some are, but probably are not what's called Web3 native or I guess in the space is the phrase I know, I'm, I really, I do feel like a weird person like crawling out of a hole right now talking to this audience because I now have my own podcast and I talk to people who are who are very in the space and so yeah. I'm like you have to regular to, <laughs> no, no, terms. I'm just I'm struggling to orient I, I like can't get it I don't know so I apologize if this is too in-depth or too not in-depth whatever but I, I think I sort of have this mantra for this year for the podcast that I'm doing uh, where it's like NFTs beyond PFPs so PFPs standing for profile pictures that's what you were describing earlier it's the apes it's like all these all these kind of JPEG images that we now associate with NFTs that feel oftentimes just like really overpriced and absurd. And weird, yeah. Um, and so really trying to highlight and have conversations on my show that that go deeper than that, um, that look more at the underlying technology, explain why it's interesting. I think the other problem we, we face right now is we're this technology is so, so new and we're still in these very like emergent stages of it. And But because there's so much money being generated around it, 
the outside world kind of looks at it like it's a fully baked technology because it's getting a lot of media coverage. So mm -hmm. they assess it like it's fully baked and like this is absurd, but they really need to be looking at it as like the early, early stages of something that's evolving. Right. I've given this analogy to you and I, I will get to the travel piece of this, but like, you know, in the very early, the first car that was ever invented in like the 1800s had a top speed of like 11 miles per hour. And then 20 years later, you had the Model T come out and it could go, I think, a top speed of 45 miles per hour. A really good horse at a sprint can go 55 miles per hour. So you, you can imagine all these people when the car was first being invented being like, what the hell is the point of this thing, right? right? Like it's slower than a horse, it's messing up the cobblestone streets. And we're further along than that in blockchain. There are some real legitimate amazing uses for blockchain that make things more efficient, et cetera, et cetera. But, it, but there's a certain level of we're there with blockchain right now, right. which is like, we're still slower than the horse sometimes. So people look at it and they're like, what, this solves nothing. Like, what is this doing? Right. And it's like, well, the infrastructure is being built so that in 30 years or 10 years or five, whatever, these systems are way more efficient and way better than what had come previously right. and, and enable all sorts of new things that we can't even fully imagine yet. You couldn't have imagined everything that came from the automobile industry when, in 1900. Um, and so I, I really trying to spell that out for folks and then having conversations that maybe give a glimpse to what that future might look like right. beyond just, again, here's my profile picture on Twitter. So that's what I'm trying to do with the show. And uh, Well, the stereotype on crypto, which I think you're working to break um, just by doing cool things, but it's... Frankly, it's guys that look and maybe sound like me, maybe a little bro Bros. and who are straight white dudes getting rich saying, take this shit to the moon. And they <laughs> use phrases like wag me and doge and GM and other, th I don't know. So what, um, but you've, you've had a lot of folks that are not even close to that mold in the slightest. Like what, um, well, what yeah, have you seen I mean, and I what needs to be highlighted more? What are your thoughts there? For sure. Uh, I think... Yeah, it's sort of like white and Asian crypto bros is sort of like a, a stereotype. Oh. Um, so I was just in Puerto Rico, for example, and uh, we were both there. We were there with Yang. And as part of that trip, I ended up interviewing, there's a there's a really blossoming NFT crypto scene happening in Puerto Rico. Right. And there's an interesting dynamic happening because you have something called Act 60, which is a law that was put in place in Puerto Rico that gives a tremendous like capital gains tax incentive incentives to... Yeah newcomers who move to the island basically you if you take up residency in puerto rico from outside of puerto rico you uh, don't have to pay capital gains taxes so of course that's attracted a ton of crypto bros and but crypto people to the island and that's sort of been the narrative around puerto rico is like crypto bros on the island you know these crypto colonizers right like that's been sort of right. but behind that is actually a burgeoning group of artists. I mean, Puerto Rico is an incredibly artistic island. You've got mm -hmm. tremendous artistic talent, the muralists, like there's all this street art. It has several really top-notch technical institutes. So you actually have some really strong engineering talent mm -hmm. coming out of Puerto Rico and that usually end up leaving Puerto Rico for uh, opportunities elsewhere. Um, and you have this really rebellious spirit uh, mm. because of its dynamic to the U.S., because of their own issues with corruption they face with the government. And so you have you know, native Puerto Ricans who are doing a, a lot when it comes to NFTs who are sort of getting erased in this narrative of like crypto colonizers. So right. I went and talked to a bunch of people, artists who are doing really interesting, innovative things with, with um, NFTs and with blockchain technology, women doing awesome art. You know, all of that stuff is, is happening. And right. I think it's, it's, you know, it's less highlighted. Now, I'm not saying there isn't a shortage of women or... Or, or a narrative, yeah. That, I, but, but, but I, you know, and I'm sort of a fan of like kind of just lead by example, uh, hopefully my just being a woman and presence in the space, like I'm not, tr I'm not, I'm not leading with that, right, with my right, womanness. Right. Like I, I host a podcast. I actually love this stuff. I just right. do the podcast. Right. I, my audience does skew more female than, for example, Bankless's audience, which um, is the network I do it through. I think probably in part because I'm a woman and people like, you know, gravitating towards sure. uh, people who, who they feel a little bit more represented by. But um, I'm just kind of trying to do it and not... Um, Good. Not like, you know, not market it intentionally right, 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 right. as a woman thing or not. I think that's that can be appealing to some people. And that's yeah, that's like the, the the challenge where it's you know, how do you get more women in in the space, if you will? Like, well, the women that are there do badass things, and other women are like, that's cool, right? Um, well, I sometimes do worry. Piece. There's so many. There is such a narrative of like there aren't enough women in Web three, and it's not. Again, it's not that there isn't a problem with that, but I do sometimes worry that messaging 
may turn off a certain, like, you know, if you're a woman and you're like hearing like there's no women here, like yeah, it kind of doesn't make you necessarily want to go do it. Right. I, I almost sometimes worry there's like a counterproductivity to that narrative. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to me just being like, hey, I'm here. I love it. I feel very welcome. I know a bunch of other women who feel the same way. Right which is a very real narrative as well, and almost to me is more compelling then to get women in the space than highlighting the lack of, the lack of it. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's helpful to have both, right? You have people of like course. Eva Longoria and, and Reese Witherspoon, like some really high profile female celebrities who are drawing attention to it, and I think if it's when it's them, it can be really helpful. Right. Um, but yeah, I just think there's different ways to approach the, like how do we make a space more diverse? Got it. Um, and I think, so having been here at South By and gone to a number of the tech events or meeting some of the tech folks. I mean, the diverse, it is a pretty diverse and interesting crowd, right? I said, like, you know, never, it's tough, to, yeah, the, some, there's some truth in these narratives that come out in the media, but they're not always grounded in, in anecdotal reality or what a lot of people's lived experiences are. Um, speaking of being on the ground, uh, you'll notice our P. Terry's cups, which uh, <laughs> apparently we are not sponsored by them. Um, so, but we're open to it. But we're open we to it. We loved your burgers and, and your fries, so we're very They're apparently open to it. A, the in and out of Austin, Texas. Mm. Though in and out is also here in Austin, Texas. Oh, so. well, yeah. So it's a bit, and I've had, this is pathetic of me, but I've had in and out yesterday and this today, P. Terry's today. Oh, celebrate that. Don't celebrate don't that. Yes. It's just, I don't that. just recommend eating two double burgers uh, in the same 24 hour span. But here we are. Um, and I would say, I don't know, it's definitely up for debate. I mean, in and out's probably better given its like national reach and success outside of one city. But P. Terry's very, very good. So, I very, very good. It. I enjoyed it. So, what I thought we'd do with Carly is get some, Andrew and I have been talking about a number of different, thing, different things on this podcast, and there have been a few times I'm like, hmm, I wonder what Carly thinks about this. And I've been able to talk to her, obviously, off the record, but wanted to get the opportunity to give her a little rapid fire and have some fun, um, which you may hate me for because I haven't really prepared you for all I, this. I'm like um, nervous, but mostly because I just like, I already see the comments being like, why the fuck are we getting this like random girl, sorry I cursed, but random girl's opinion on uh, X, Y, or Z. But you know what? Because here I because am. Because you're here. And... Um, <clears throat> I think you're a smart, thoughtful human, and Thank it's one of the that. things we want this show is, is trying to put smart, thoughtful people um, to talk about the issues of the day, because frankly, that's tough to find. That's sad. It's really sad, but it's reality, and I think a lot of, that's a lot of the feedback I well, get well, from here's, this show. Here's the good news. Here's what you will get from me. Like, my, uh, call it media diet, is so weird at this point. Again, mostly because like Twitter, which is where I historically have gotten news, is like now all crypto stuff. You're going to get a very interesting uh, Great. perspective. You're you're not going to get somebody who's reading your typical sources. Good. <laughs> um, so let's. So a couple things. So an, one, the big one is Andrew and I have been talking a lot about boys and men oh, yeah. um, and the boys and men crisis. Yep. And we've talked a lot about it, but the biggest, at least my biggest takeaway, and Andrew doesn't say it as maybe with as much conviction the way I say it, and so he'd probably maybe pick a different major takeaway, but my big takeaway is that um, the failure and the crisis that boys and men are having right now, and when men disintegrate, it hurts women. So if you want to be a strong champion of women, um, counterintuitively, you may need to start with focusing on boys and men and keeping men strong and whole, which obviously is ridiculous and sounds like a men's right activist to be like, hey, you want to focus on women? Like, start with the guys. But the reality, like, the numbers are true, right? And um, weak men and broken men um, either make society worse, which ends up hurting women and girls, or proactively hurt women and girls. Yeah. So thoughts on this? Because here we are two dudes talking about this, but I know you to be um, very feminist and one of the reasons you um, joined the Andrew Yang campaign was because you told me universal based skin can be universally the best thing we could do for women to empower women yeah, internationally so yeah, yeah. and all over the world right so thoughts on the boy crisis yeah uh, so I I totally agree I mean I, you know I think obviously we don't want to treat it as an either or situation I think you know right. in some ways the the boy crisis, you know, it stems out of maybe too much of a focus solely on on the crisis of women. I mean, I, I struggle to say that. So, like, you don't want to reverse this and now just, like, go 100% and, like, 
only deal with the, the suffering of, of men and boys. Yeah. Go back. You know, just I, swing the pendulum back. Yeah, of where course. We like it's, women it's, at all in it's, the, it's called the sixties, seventies, right? Yeah. So I think um, I think it's, but I totally agree, and I, I think the reason that men not come first, but you're as you're sort of phrasing it like that, is the physical dominance piece, and it, it's not across the board. You obviously have lots of you know super physically strong women, but like obviously on the whole, men are, are physically dominant over women, um, and, and that's. That's at the heart of this whole thing. The that's reason what, you have the reason, right? yeah. well, the reason you have to care about men and to some extent need to even think about it as like a, a, a critically important piece of the women issue is that right? Because the second a woman is raped or assaulted or or abused, you know, that's a light that has a lifetime impact on somebody. Right. You know, and I, I hesitate. Obviously, you can go on and do incredible things as a woman dealing with that, but it's just an extra layer of baggage that you have to deal with and carry right. with you and fight through. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, because of that, of course, we need to focus on the health of, of men and boys because if they're hurting, they you know hurt people, hurt people. You right. know, as a girl, you learn that like bullying, hurt girls, hurt girls, right? Like bullying in seventh grade is like that, but you know it's true across the board. And so, as long as um, Weak men will hurt hurt women. Right. Um, How can um, men on this team talk about it without coming off like an ass? That's actually that's the root of most of the things I'm trying to talk about. I'm just I'm trying to solve problems without sounding like an ass. Um, and that and the problem with solving problems is you have to make a judgment. There's a hierarchy there. You have to make a decision. Um, and decisions are never perfect. And usually the best ones are utilitarian, like greatest good for the greatest number, right? Um, so that's a challenge for everybody, but specifically, like personally, like, is there a way things guys like myself or Andrew, um, trying to champion this can do better, can talk about it better. Not to put, I'm putting you on the spot, but, um, cause I, again, didn't prepare Carly for this. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I'm sort of a weird person to ask about this because I agree with you guys. And so I, when I, when I. I, ha- I haven't, admittedly, I have not listened to like the main podcast episode you did about this. That's okay. Sorry. Um, but I, I agree with you, and I, I do tend to think that the criticism that gets levied at these kinds of arguments when they're being made in the way that like I've heard you make them, usually don't feel like they're engaging with the argument in good faith, right? They're sort of mm. they're extrapol they're he- t- hearing what you're saying and they're extrapolating a whole bunch of other opinions from that. Right. But the things that we do in politics in general right now, like if you express an opinion that leaves leans call it left or is left, the the right will extrapolate a whole bunch of things about what that means you must also believe. You're also the And then you left, do right? the the reverse, right? If you have an opinion that leans right, the left will then take that and extrapolate that means you must believe all these other XYZ things about this. So right. I think when you start to get into talking about you know, a crisis of boys and men, there's all these extrapolations that get made which, you know, that means you want to conform to very traditional gender roles mm-hmm. like you know you it means you must think that men are made to go out and work and be strong and women should stay home like things that are not at all what you guys are saying so I, I think part of it is um, the lead by example piece which is you know hi- highlighting areas where um, I don't know I'm like struggling to even say that like to, to really think about it like, and, and like, like, it's not on you to find the answer I'm just more yeah. curious um, Again, it's trying not to be an asshole and trying to engage in good faith, which is something you do naturally, given who you are. But if there's ways to, um, I don't like turning off the left because right. um, I generally align with. Well, a like Liz Plank is a you know is yes, a certain friend of yours, pause. yeah, and is a friend of yours who I think is doing a obviously is is very much coming from the left, and and as a woman, it's sort of she's in a different position than you are as like a very yes. like certain looking kind of dude, um, but she. She obviously does a good job talking about the masculinity crisis. Now, yes. I think she leans more on the side of, like, we need to make sure that boys can be sensitive and, and feel emotional. And she yes. looks at, like, you know, when uh, babies, if you look at babies, like, uh, you know, baby boys are as, as if not more emotive than, like, baby girls right. are. And that, you know, there's a certain level of, like, acculturating that out of people. Um, yep. And, you know, I think there's a... I don't know. I think you give some really specific examples, even that come from your dad, right, of, like, you know, when you decide what the responsibilities are in a relationship, right? Like, you live up to that, right? Like, if right. you were taking out the trash, right, and then your wife is nagging you eight times, like, about taking out the trash, and you're like, oh, she's such a nag, and it's like, well, did you take out the trash? Like, yeah. did you did you do did your you job do your, as a supportive like, husband? Yeah, as, as a supportive as partner, a provider, and it doesn't have right? to, you know, like, this goes across both ways, and I think, you know, that's a really good example of, like, what it means to be a strong man, in your opinion, that is, like, obviously not toxic, 
Um, That's a good, so one, like skipping so the, the actual examples. story is that my dad would say when he does a lot of his men's ministry, he would have guys come in and they'd say, I know you want me to be like, treat my wife like, like the, the Bible and my dad's Christian. And then, um, I grew up in a Christian home and he, you know, one of the things the Bible says is like, love your wife, like Christ loved the church, like kind of the, the ethos of it. And Christ died for the church in the Bible. So it's like, so it's literally like what you should, you know. Do everything, you know, essentially die for your wife in like the hypothetical sense, but you should, it should be number one to you. And so that he'd have guys come in in the men's ministry and they're like, look, I know I'm supposed to, you know, love my wife and be this, but she just nags me all the time. And he'd be like, well, what is she nagging you about? I was like, well, I gotta make the bed or vacuum the this or take out the trash. He's like, well, flip that on your head, man, on its head. If you believe it's your job to provide for your wife and keep her safe and keep her loving, fulfilled and, and happy, then this is your job, man. So it's not her job to take out the trash. It's She's reminding you to do your damn job. And so like flipping that mindset is like the male, the provider, which isn't toxic or getting Well, I was going to say, I mean, even you saying that like if you believe the man's role is like to provide for the wife, I think that's where you start to get this bristling on the okay. part of the left of like, oh, that sounds like though like, so then what does that mean her job is? If it's his job to provide for her, that sounds very like this traditional gender role thing where like you have to go out and provide and, and I have I to have stay to at home and, and whatever nurture. and that becomes my job, right? And right. I think it's a, it's a, I think the, the core of what you're saying is more like whatever two people, right? Whatever genders, whatever relationship it is, right? Like decide the kind of respective roles are. It's about consistently showing up for your side of the role, right? Yeah. Like I think it'll be, I want to have kids and I very much want to work and, you know, I'm like, want my husband to be very involved in the kids, right? right. And so if that, that then for him, it's like, whatever the responsibility is around helping to raise those children or, and that's why the trash example or cleaning up is good because that's usually the woman's role. Like it, it's about like, okay, we all are gonna have days where we don't wanna do certain things, but part of being in a relationship and being a strong adult and like therefore a strong man is like mm -hmm. doing whatever your end of the bargain is. Um, and I yeah. think that can that that end of the bargain doesn't have to be what is traditionally have a masculine just make the role. Money, right? It's like you know, or be the disciplinarian. Yeah, um, it's like the being a, a man is is fulfilling whatever your your side of that bargain and, is. And I don't think the Bible is always the best in terms of uh, like some of the. I mean, the church has been responsible for a lot of these traditional gender roles that I think gone to certain extremes or even taken out of context or taken literally can be awful, yeah, right? Of course. But much of the most of the worst ones are in the Old Testament, um, and for Bible context, the New Testament is like how we should do things going forward. And then, so the New Testament has a, a little bit of a um, more positive ethos of it. Um, and there's a you know one of the things that uh, that Christ talked about was uh, being equally yoked in a marriage, and that's like that's where to me and that really and that can be a relationship or anything. But having like equally yoked or yin and yang, like that can be anything. Yeah. It doesn't have to be in a traditional format as long as it's balanced, right? When you and I debate this, because I feel like you can take the best parts of any book. It feels like a little bit the Bible stuff is just like taking the best parts of the Bible. It's like you take the best parts of you Socrates definitely can. It and just also feels have like, good uh, lessons, but. <laughs> but there's some books, uh, and the Bible may be one of them, where it's like they have some pretty, some black and white stuff, and it feels like, oh, I'm gonna take the stuff I like and not the other stuff I like. Some of it's hard, right? But um, I agree with you, like trying to, there's some verse in the Bible, you're like, oh, that's probably not one we wanna celebrate. Um, Anyway, this is not a religious podcast, y'all, um, but I, I do think religion in context of everything is, is, always, is always helpful. Last thing I want to ask you about, Carly, and then maybe we'll end on more of a positive note. Um, Ukraine. Mm. <laughs> You're yeah, like this kind is where the YouTube commenters are like, why the Why is she talking about Ukraine? Because um, why not? Woman um, talking about Ukraine. Where, I just want, I'm curious your thoughts. We yeah. haven't talked about it. We've been talking about it a lot. And, um, yeah, of course. It's like what's in the news. Our last conversation was about how Ukraine put a lot of things in perspective on, uh, <laughs> you know, I've been called on Twitter. Like anyone who gets to a certain size on Twitter gets called awful things, like the root of all evil or whatever the hell you're called. And then... You're looking at Russia, and you're like, well, I mean, maybe I'm not maybe the root of all evil, perhaps. <laughs> um, what, I mean, what are your thoughts on what's going on, how we're digesting it? It's like just like shocking uh, and obviously tragic, and it does feel like I, I, I'm, I'm so curious 
about Putin's thinking because it does feel like he must have just categorically underestimated the resolve of the Ukrainian people, mm -hmm. uh, and I, and I think the unani like unanimity of the West's response. I mean, you know, I find it like I was saying this I think the other day with somebody like flabbergasting that Switzerland like is not neutral. You know, like they got mm. they got. Um, Switzerland, who was neutral during World War II Switzerland, against the Nazis. Like, it was neutral, like, to, was the neutral to the Nazis and has, has now, you know, um, right. taken stand. So that's, I think, very interesting. Um, you know, I, uh, it's tragic. I heard, so I listen to the All In podcast. I'm a big fan of that. I bet, yeah. there's, I bet there's a good deal of overlap They don't between, sponsor us, but they're a fun pod. Yeah, I'm sure there's a... I a, think David Sachs and Andrew are doing a podcast sometime soon. Oh, cool. Good. Well, and, and Sachs is... Is, is very smart. Again, uh, agree or disagree where he kind of lies politically because I think sure. he's more the right wing of, of that group. Yeah. But like a super sharp guy and, and I think he actually talked about this. He was like, you know, he's pretty isolationist. Like he's like absolutely under no circumstances, I think largely speaking, I'm not trying to put words in his mouth, but like we should not get ourselves militarily involved in Ukraine. Um, and they were doing sort of an interesting look at after or, or right before Putin invaded Crimea um, the sort of question around Ukraine joining NATO was like bubbling to the surface again. And I don't know exactly what precipitated the whole thing, right? But essentially you had, Putin's made it very, very clear that he does not, that he cannot stomach having Ukraine or uh, join NATO because right. then he's surrounded, whatever. Um, so uh, Antony Blinken, he came out and quite forcefully sort of made a statement saying that NATO's doors were open, like basically directly rebuffing Putin and saying like, we will very much keep the, option of Ukraine joining NATO mm -hmm. a possibility. Right. And so All In was making this argument that I just think is interesting and people may agree with it or not. I don't even know how I feel about it. But like basically that was a, 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 such a miscalculation because that has put us in a position now where we don't know is Putin invading Ukraine simply on this question of NATO and like, you know, he's, he's really just doing it to... Uh, Mm -hmm. keep Ukraine from joining NATO, which I think he can get a lot more sympathy from from his own people and, and elsewise? Or is there a grander kind of Hitlerian ambition here, right? right. Like, is this a, a madman now who really wants to, like, you know, take over Europe? Now, I've had people make the point, like, he wouldn't be able to take over Europe. But, like, whatever. It, 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 he does it, have nukes, but, you know. But he's not, you know, Europe that, that is, becomes right? a totally, yes. you know, then it is just the mutually assured destruction thing. So that was just an interesting argument of, like, looking back at what our foreign policy has been and, and was that a misstep? Should we have categorically said, no, we won't let Ukraine into NATO to avoid a situation like this? Interesting. Um, I, you know, I don't know where it falls, but I just, I hadn't really somebody heard right. somebody lay that out, and I, I think it's interesting. So the best situation, I think, for the U.S. appears to be Ukraine holds, mm -hmm. and we help from outside looking in. The way we all know we're doing, the way the you know the UN and EU and essentially are helping, um, and all these other countries in their own way, and then you know to Andrew's point before is that Russia declares its own victory, but it's really a loss, and then this all kind of goes away, um, and then US didn't have to do anything. I think that's an important point. Is like we have to give an exit path to Putin because he's so prideful and he has such an ego, and right. so it's sort of like how we as the West can help to facilitate, uh, I, like we, I believe we should, like whatever right. sort of saving face mechanism he needs to ideally be able to Just leave Ukraine and isolated. but feel like his, his face has been saved. Um, uh, which is rough. Um, but we're going to, so the other thing that I'm, I'm curious your thoughts about, and maybe ties a, the boys and men crisis that come up before, is that so when we have these wars, <laughs> Putin boys being go to men. A, no, but, no, not Putin that. is a model of a, of a boy and a man no, in no, crisis. No, no, no. Oh, kind so, yeah. of. <laughs> Um, but no, but he has his own definition of masculinity and feels a purpose. Like there are things there that I mean, he's obviously got That's the toxic, the toxic part. Toxic masculinity um, in a in a human form. Right. I, I, I don't know. That we can debate that all day. I, I'm not saying he's not a toxic masculinity. My point is like he did he didn't fall without a purpose and then grab on down these YouTube rabbit holes and, and feeling or depressed anxiety and that sort of thing. He's been clearly like has a fucked up purpose, has been living that in a certain you know what I'm saying? I think it's a different type of well, but it's, it's a very, very prideful kind of like, you know, nationalism feels like a very masculine yes. thing. It's like this but that very, has, that's like, not the type of men we've been talking about, okay. you know what I'm saying? Um, well, maybe that's that would help you with the left if you did start maybe talking <coughs> about those kinds of Because <laughs> that, that is very much a crisis as well, right? And those are very much the kind of men who are hurting women. And so I think, you know, as you're looking for yeah, tips, uh, I you're, think you're making a good point. Those. I'm just wondering, you know, I'm thinking about like, uh, what I'm talking about is like damaged men, you know, you've, and boys that you see. Who's damaged? The damage I'm talking about where the guy becomes a school shooter, 
I don't think it's the same type of damage you're talking about Putin. No, but it, yeah. it, it, there's a similar, it's a similar just talk. Like he just went, uh, your yeah. wiring was I such that right. you went a different direction. I think right. But like, he's, he's shooting up an entire fucking country. This kind of brings me back to maybe the first thing when we're talking about boys and men, where there's a reason Russia has not had success invading Ukraine. And it's because the Ukraine army feels like they have something to fight for. Mm -hmm. um, but, it, it, you know, who's fighting in these wars, right? It's young men. We're talking probably 18 to 35, right? Probably younger than that. Um, you probably have some 16-year-olds and 15-year-olds who can carry a gun. Squeeze in there. And then probably, you know, 30 is probably the, the average, like, median, if you will, on the, the higher end. Um, do you think this generation's, like, fundamentally less violent or less purposeful in that existential, like, this is worth fighting and dying over. I mean, a lot the of Ukrainian. I, mean, I think if you look at the United States, I mean, you look at a lot of other countries. When it came, when it came, push comes to shove to bearing arms. Like I feel like our threshold for war and that type, of, like where I'm going to take a gun and fight, is a lot higher. Um, and you're seeing on the Russian side right now, they're like, dude, we don't like. Many of them like, we don't care. We thought we we're going to win. We're not. Oops. Shrug. Right. I mean, at least as the rumors coming out. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think this is like, you know, this is again another all-in podcast point, like the fog of war, like we have no idea, that's right? Like, we, don't know we are anything, being yeah. propagandized. So much of the stuff that we're seeing is Ukrainian propaganda. They're doing very well, and I don't blame that's them for that. Point. But like, we have, it's, it's, we're in, the, it's, it's a war zone. Like, we can't trust. If you learn anything, um, if we learned anything from the campaign is that most people on the outside have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. And that's not anyone's fault. Yeah. It's just the reality is, I learned that at UBS too. Like people see what the brand of UBS was when I was working. And like inside I was like way more complicated than that. Yeah. And just, we, we're not going to go public on it. Everybody's on right. the team. That's, that's that. So there's definitely that, that piece, um, which is why, you know, again, we're not experts. But I always think curious to get a rational person's thoughts on this type of thing. Well, let me turn it on you, Zach. We talked about sort of my projects at the, the start of this, uh, and not to make this like a shill episode, but you had a big announcement. I don't believe you have mentioned it on this podcast oh, since no, we the announcement came it. out. Oh, what do you mean? Since the book came out? I thought you said this Haven't was the first podcast. What, the book. Oh, we talked about it in the last episode a bit. Oh, I asked you if this was the first episode to come out since the book. Yes, but we, but the book was launched essentially on that episode, so since then. Got it. Okay. okay. Well, that, well, no. I mean, I guess just basically, like you know, I, I sort of was uh, was there during the behind the scenes writing of it. I, you put so much into this, and like I've you know read it. Probably not its most recent draft, but I've read earlier drafts. It's really funny. I think people are really gonna like it. And I'm not funny, so that's. No, no, you're funny though. You've got you're a funny writer. Once in a, once in a while, I can write funny because you can edit it and take out the bad jokes. Because I'm, I'm I bat like 100 on jokes. Is there like a story in the book that you're most excited for people to see? Hmm. Or like a takeaway, more like a lesson. That I kind of want to hear you. Like. I was like, there's two two things. There's a bunch of lessons I want people to take away. We should probably dive in. I will dive in with them with Andrew. For those of you who don't like to read, we'll give you the Spark the Notes, Notes version on this podcast. But I'll say a couple of things. One is I really want people to understand the like like how much of a long shot it was. And I like the yeah. first chapter opens with like a detailed description of our first terrible Andrew Yang political event where it's like a shitty Yang banner, ten people show up. We we got like Stella beers and Tostitos hint of lime chips, and we forgot to buy napkins, and they're on like Amazon folding tables, and people have to like take the napkins off the paper towel, or, like take the, take the paper towels off the bounty roll sort of thing, and it's a disaster. And we're like taking pictures, make the crowds look bigger. It's not good. To then how big it got, where it's like almost ten thousand people in MacArthur Park in LA with like literal sparks flying and, and that kind of pyrotechnics. Um, so that ride is like point of it, um, and that which is fundamentally, I think, funny um, and fun. And then I think um, the most exciting story to me is the um, I don't call give it, too much of it away. Just no, give I won't. The, but like I, the comeback to me between like the first Miami debate where Andrew was really sick and, and we well, don't give it. You're giving too much away. There is a story. A oh, we've okay, talked about this back. though. Stop, no, the, it, there was a first it's, debate, and if you don't remember it. Read the book. Okay. And then there was a second debate. And then debate. there was a second debate where he And came if back. you don't know what so happened in a second debate, read the book. And then stuff happened in between. Come on, man. <laughs> I, I, like, like, I think you have to tell more about the story making exciting. That's, that's the story. And I think 
a lot there, of it was yeah. a lot what we did along the process to stand out and I think a, a number of things not everything of course but a number of things we did would help anyone compete in the attention economy as a long shot or an outsider so I hope the book like can stand the test of time that's my yeah. hope um, but anyway it's gonna be fun I think the end guy's gonna love it so I um, I'm an author now. It's been weird. It's been very weird. Very um, cool. And I'm sure we'll get your crypto book in the future, Carl, okay. and then we can have you back on here oh to teach the audience about what it's like to be in a space. Yeah. Uh, anyway. Okay. Cool. Uh, I have to go to a call. But That's our show. Thanks for having That's me on. That's our show. My homecoming Thank you. Speaks. Next week, we might have Andrew Yang back on his own podcast. Or Unclear. It might be me Tune again. in next week. We'll see you Monday. Love you guys.